No. Covering the drugs is a cannabis-fueled burnout. Covering the rock and roll and the rough and tumble is punch em up WWF. And apart from all that, you'll find news, reviews, and in approximately 25 minutes, the end credits. But first... Christmas is coming and the goose is getting fat, but not as fat as a wad of dough that Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo are hoping to get this festive season. As gamers, we are the target of large corporations who've spent much time and much money trying to figure out how to get us into the shops and then how to get us to part with our cash. So right now, to even things up a bit, we're going to pull back the curtain and reveal the tricks of the ad man's trade. Let's start with a look back at the gaming ads of yesteryear. Worried about what to get the kids for Christmas. Well, worry no more. Get them stick. Way back in 1995, Sony unleashed their PlayStation on a game-skeptical public. The problem was how to interest a consumer who hadn't played computer games since they were at school. So give them stick. Better that than they get PlayStation. Remember, saps, do not underestimate the power of PlayStation. The SAP SAP sets out the brand values that PlayStation have continued to build. So PlayStation set up as a subversive thing to have. Stickity, stickity, stick. In 1997, the Shapes campaign hit our screens. It was brilliant in its simplicity. All the complexities of the PlayStation brand were distilled into, well, some shapes. Do not underestimate the power of the PlayStation. Could almost be um, a proclamation from Al Qaeda. It sounds like some secret terrorist sect that's saying we're much, much more dangerous than you think. And it's incredibly flattering to the, uh, the target audience as well as an incredibly powerful way to describe all the clever stuff that's locked up inside that box. For years I've lived the double life. The double life ads graced our screens in 1998. They had a slightly different agenda to the previous campaigns. Night, I live a life of exhilaration. I've missed heartbeats and adrenaline. You see, gaming at this time had kind of a crappy image. Games were seen as childish, sad, and tragically unhip. PlayStation ads said exactly the opposite. Immerse yourself in a cool, anti-authoritarian culture. If you're passionate about gaming, and you don't want to appear like some kind of nerd or geek, to make you feel part of some secret society or a glamorous, dangerous, subversive, with loads of power, is a great appeal. It's called Quick World. That's a bit everyone remembers. But that's Christmas past. Now we have the powerful PlayStation 2 and the uber-advanced Game Boy Advance. These super slick machines come with equally slick ads. Welcome to the third place. PlayStation ads, it's the content of the ad that selects the target audience. The kids that are too young won't understand it. So the ad is actually selecting the people who understand it and are into it. Enough PlayStation already. What about the Game Boy? Well, the Game Boy ads are very, very different from the PlayStation ads. Now, we know that um, the target audience for Game Boys is the average age is 18 years old. This guy is in his early 20s. So they're obviously trying to reach an adult audience. But what of the future? Well, you haven't escaped the clutches of the ad men yet. The conveyor belt of consumerism just keeps on rolling. Microsoft's first ploy is word of mouth. Yeah, they want to be the talk of the gaming town. Initially, we want to get make sure that the hardcore gamers are really convinced about the Xbox, and then that word of mouth engine will continue on. And if they've already sort of embraced the brand, then they'll join the party. And Nintendo's GameCube is arriving next summer. If the American launch is anything to go by, we Brits can expect a long hot summer of cube clubs. With Zany, what would you do for a GameCube competition? And loads of freebies. Score! I know absolutely sod all about American wrestling. Proper wrestling with real wrestlers like Big Daddy and Kendo Nagasaki, well that's different. I think we all deep down inside respect a big fat bastard in a leotard beating the crap out of another fat man. It's primal, instinctive, like the need to sniff a girl's shoes when she leaves the room. But the designers haven't bothered to make a wrestling game based on our pie-guzzling Saturday afternoon heroes. Instead, they've gone for the slightly more lucrative world of WWF. WWF Smackdown features some of the biggest names from this pretend sport. Now, I only know they're famous because I asked a 12-year-old and he assures me that The Rock is wicked, whatever that means. 
you get a choice of playing options, including the story section, where you have to make it in the crazy world that is WWF. And this adds a little to the game, but really, all you want is to get sweaty and pummel one or two men in the ring. So forget the story and just head to the tournament. Now, I've been singing its praises so far, and it has loads of features with different kinds of fights and teams, and this will make a million teenagers on council estates cream themselves. But it isn't flawless. The controls are terrible, really fiddly and complicated. Now, I'm a busy man. I do not have two hours to spend working out how to make an American put another American into a half Nelson. I want to be able to do it instantly. That's it, grab his arm, twist him round, kick him in the back like a big girl! But to be honest, this game hasn't really been designed for me. It's been made for those mysterious fans of WWF, the ones who are genuinely surprised that this is not an Olympic sport. And to be honest, I think they'll love this. God bless them. Smack you around the face, the tart! Welcome to the Thumb Bandits News Desk, where we bring you news from the Global Gaming Village. Here's the Village Idiot. I'm fully armed, got my Pokeballs ready to go In full of that tag, I pick a pick a pick at you Just take your day, I'm bad for double trouble Won't take a bow to the notorious couple They're called 50 Point Grind and the track is gotta catch them all New metal American thrash meets crap Japanese animation in a healthy example of how not to reach a target audience. Anyone over nine who does not see through this is probably in the band. Not really limp biscuit, more just limp panic. Do you see my pocket monster? And staying Japanese, game-making legends SNK have finally bowed out after 20 years of video gaming. The company responsible for the Neo Geo Pocket have finally lost the uphill struggle against the Game Boy. Oh, R.I.P. SNK. Elsewhere, new British developers Prey Digital are set to unveil their brand new title, Stung. Procedures. The premise of the game is a tongue-in-cheek take in the Half-Life plot, with a war raging between modified insects with micro-machine-style obstacles, including kettles and flypaper traps. It looks like it's going to be a real holler. Now, in the run-up to Christmas, burnout publishers acclaim are blatantly courting controversy with their stance on drug driving. Yes, research they claim to have carried out indicates that playing their game whilst stoned improves your performance. Claims say that being moderately high can improve your lap times, race tactics, and racing line. But they are warning everyone that taking a hit within the game will slow you down. All avid viewers will know that three empty seats and three expectant screens means it's kangaroo court, judge, and jury time. This week's gun-toting gamers are Paul, Scott, and Rowan. This week we're looking at the best new shoot 'em up. Facing the Firing Squad or Time Crisis 2, Headhunter, and Ghost Recon. Out for the Dreamcast in November, Headhunter. In the not-so-distant future, committing a crime means that you're indebted to the state. If you don't have the cash, you're paying a body parts mate. This could only come from the sick and twisted mind of an X-Files creator. Hey, it did. But did our jury think that it was X-rated or X-directory? Keep your eyes open. That headhunter could show up and the boss wants him bad. Is it eye candy or an eyesore? It's pretty much eye candy. It's a gorgeous looking game. Best part of the game for me is the story, the plot itself. Very filmic, very cinematic. Um, you get very involved in it. Anything let it down? Yeah, for me it was too much of a mix of styles, too much of a mix of genres of game. It compares to Metal Gear Solid, it has aspects of Driver, even things like Silent Hill and Tomb Raider in there as well. But then it's disturbed by the fact that you're changing your style straight away almost. Talk to me, Paul. Who is going to like this game? If you're an RPG fan, a shooter fan, then it's going to suit your fancy because it's got both in there. And finally, is it worth the price? For £30, it's great value. Time Crisis 2 won't blow you away with any high polluting plots or concepts. The idea is simple. Shoot them before they shoot you! Action! Action! How does this compare to the first one? Is this as good as better, not as good? Uh, well, 
pretty much the same, but I mean, it's been updated for the PS2, so it's nicer graphics, it's mm. going a bit faster. What's the story like? I don't really care. The story in Time Crisis is never the most important part. You pick it up to shoot for a while, you get the blood rush to put it down. Now, what would you say is the worst part of this game? Um, the fact that it does become very repetitive very quickly. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the worst part of this game? Game over. Last and perhaps least is Ghost Recon. Now, author Tom Clancy's name may not instantly conjure up images of battle-worn hard men, but if you're a fan of the Rainbow Six series, then you already associate this guy with facial scars and extreme forms of heavy weaponry. Equipped with the latest battlefield technology and trained in the latest techniques of covert warfare, they strike swiftly, silently, invisibly. They call themselves the Ghosts. Ghost Recon, where does it fall in the great genre scheme of things? Oh, bit of a tricky one that. Um, it's a shooter, but it's quite tactical as well, so it takes a wee bit of time to get into. Does it bring out the soldier in you, cowboy? <laughs> I'm afraid my fatigues are still in the cupboard. Now, how difficult was Ghost Recon to pick up and play for a console gamer like yourself? Very difficult, actually. It's very thorough, very exacting. It's a strategy game, but it's a lot you have to learn in the first place anyway. But it seemed like I was spending a long time just training. You know, so are you ready to drag your fatigues on then? Yeah, I've got the treasures on at least. Just let me run and find my coat. Now then, Scott, you're a bit of a PC strategy boy. How does it compare to other strategy titles? It's great. It's fantastic. I loved it. If you like the likes of uh, Project IGI, uh, Rogue Spear, Rainbow Six, then this game for you. For what I liked about it from the start was the way that you controlled your squad. They had a bit of an AI. They had uh, the you what they were doing, but you could control them. You could give them suggestions and orders. You're a bit of a control freak then. Well, yeah, at home, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, I don't want to know about that. So with immaculately bad taste, it would appear our gamers enjoyed all three games this evening, but there's only one that can blast their head off. With votes of two to one, it's Headhunter. Greetings, etc. Generic expression of gratitude, followed by teasing mention of what's to come. Ditto, accompanied by girly smile. That's conversational shorthand. And now for something slightly sad. The Dreamcast, the original next generation console, looks like it's going to be the first 128-bit machine to be consigned to the technological dustbin. As 2001 may be the last we hear of the Dreamcast, we thought we'd have a look at the console's top-selling games. Part chart, part obituary. A chibituary, if you will. Dead or Alive has had several incarnations, but one thing has remained throughout, the buxom women. Sure, there are great interactive and multi-leveled fighting arenas. Sure, it has one of the best fighting systems. But Dead or Alive is all about taking scantily clad women who could have you for breakfast, or preferably before breakfast, and getting them to perform some extraordinary high kicks. Winner! At number four is Sonic Adventure. Sega's hedgehog mascot has come on leaps and bounds since he appeared on the Sega Genesis console in 1991. Sonic Adventure may be 3D, but at the end of the day, what we're talking about here is still collecting rings and defeating end-of-level baddies and Sonic's nemesis, Dr. Robotnik. Crazy Taxi is in third place. While so many driving games opt to play the SIM card, Crazy Taxi decided to play the Crazy Card. The more you drive like a joyrider, the better it gets. The music's good and the passengers scream and the pedestrians run for cover. I guess deep down, everyone wants to be a Travis Bickle. Far from being a simple PlayStation to Dreamcast copy or an update, Resident Evil, codenamed Veronica, is hailed by many as the best in the series. No surprise then to find the game at the number two spot. Got more blood in it than a Cary High School reunion. Ooh. But looking like the cat that got the cream in the Dreamcast Game of the Year chart is Star Wars Episode One: Jedi Power Battles. As the name suggests, the game involves Jedi power battles. Your wits, skill and telekinetic powers go up against droids and evildoers in that galaxy far, far away. Each level relates specifically to the film. This is the game you are looking for. So the Dreamcast is on the way out, proving that it's the Betamax of the next generation. Pray a moment's silence for its 128 bits. I don't think so, to be honest, love. Oh. Why not? Well, because it imbues an inanimate object with what are essentially uniquely human feelings. And to be honest, it's just a plastic consumer product. Okay. Fire. Water. Earth. Air. The four elements, but who, what, and where is the fifth? 
Enough of all this new age hokum. New York Race is a futuristic racing game that's loosely based on a high profile film, The Fifth Element. It features hovering ships, stunning locations, and more adrenaline than a bungee jump on amphetamines. Well, we've heard that one before. 1999's Phantom Menace tried this very same tactic. Take the only worthwhile scene in a relatively poor film, turn it into a racing game, and suck it dry. It's too bloody hard. This isn't pick up and play. This is pick up and get a degree in thumb bending. Secondly, there's no sense of speed. A New York race requires too much brain power. Despite the jaw dropping city streets, the game is dull. But you still have to work like a bastard to get to the end of the level. And what about multiplayer versus two on PlayStation 2 and up to eight on PC? It is a saving grace because against a human being, you actually have a chance to beat your opponent. New York Race is a classic example of style over content. On the surface, it's deep, but deep down, it's shallow. It's out to buy now for the PC, the PlayStation 2, and the Game Boy Advance. Looking forward to next April with more Glee than the Tax Man, it's time for Sneaky Peek. Hey man, hang ten, get gnarly with your goofy foot and cut sick as you check out the awesomeness of everything that's trans world surf for the Xbox, dude. Yeah. Shut up and speak English. What Alex is trying to say is that Microsoft's Plastic Breeze Block will be releasing an extreme sports series in autumn of 2002. Trans World Surf features a test your karma feature as you ride on the crest of a wave and interact with obstacles like other surfers, photographers, bodyboarders and dolphins. If your karma meter reaches the levels of a McDonald's employee, you better watch out because it triggers shark attacks. Trans World Surf will be rip curling and toe curling its way onto an Xbox near you in September 2002. One of the most important games for the Xbox launch is Shrek. Now, there haven't been very many characters throughout history whose farts have been used as deadly weapons. But then again, there haven't been very many ogres who were born and bred in festering putrid swamps. Hey! It's one of the Xbox's launch titles. You take control of the Great Green One as he travels through four worlds, 12 levels, and 36 missions during 80 hours of gameplay. Forget all that cloak and dagger nonsense about secret game development because we can unveil new footage of the Cape Crusader on the GameCube. And for someone who's been fighting crime for over 60 years, this pensioner still looks rather sprightly. The plot of Batman Dark Tomorrow is the usual jiggery pokery about an evil mastermind, a plan for world dominance, and an orphan with a major crime fighting chip on his shoulder. But from what we've seen so far, this may well prove to be the best of the series to date. The makers have enlisted the help of real Hollywood stuntmen to help animate some of the set pieces in the game. Look out for some fantastically grimy looking playing environments like the sewers, the downtown area and notorious Arkham Asylum. Batman Dark Tomorrow will be available on the GameCube when the console is released over here next autumn. Mm -hmm. Oh well, it's getting on for Whoa, nearly... Oh yes it is. What have we got next week? I don't know. Ah, well I do you see, we've got James Bond, Jack and Daxter, Worms and more on the Xbox. And don't forget our competition on the website at www.channel4.com forward slash thumbbandits. I'm glad that's over. Do you fancy a little pre-Christmas no. drink? No, no, let's play Spunky Monkey. It's fantastic. You drink as much beer as you can, and the last person to... No, that involves climbing off a monkey's no. process. Quite unpleasant. No, let's play quarters. What's that? It's an American game. Mm. Take quarters and bounce them, pop them in the bottom. Yeah, that doesn't sound like any fun whatsoever. Let's play The Drunk Lady Sings. No, let's play Asshole. Now you're talking.